So you've done some damage to your metabolism and you've slowed it down. Maybe you've been dieting a little too hard over the years. Maybe age is catching up with you. Maybe stress is catching up with you. Well, I'm gonna give you some ways to repair or fix your metabolism. 10 ways to be exact. Now these aren't ways to just spike your metabolism or boost your metabolism, okay? I'm, I'm not all about that kind of generic stuff. I'm talking about repairing a damaged metabolism because most of the reasons that our metabolism slow down is simply because we've done some damage to it and we can repair it if we apply a lot of these principles or even all of these principles or just one of them occasionally. So I'm gonna break them all down and we give you 10 of them. Hey, we've got new videos coming out just about every single day nowadays, okay, at 7.30 a.m. Pacific time. So if you like good health content, just make sure you're keeping it locked in here. Hit that red subscribe button, and then that little bell icon is gonna allow you to turn on notifications so you know whenever I go live or post a new video. Also, after you watch this video, go ahead and check out ButcherBox. If you eat meat at all, then you've gotta check out ButcherBox. Grass-fed, grass-finished meat delivered right to your doorstep, and I kid you not, it's cheaper than the grocery store. So you get it delivered right to your doorstep, never have to leave the house, and it's the highest quality stuff. Plus, there's a discount and some cool add-ons for those that are watching my channel or watch my videos. So if you're gonna get it, you might as well get it to the description down below. But let's watch the video first. All right, jumping right into it. The number one thing that I would like you to do to repair your metabolism is start paying more attention to your thyroid by getting more in the way of iodine and chromium in the mix. Much of the metabolic damage that occurs within our body is because of the thyroid. Okay, when our metabolism is slowing down, it's generally our thyroid slowing down. This happens with age, it happens with stress, it happens with bad foods, autoimmune conditions, whatever. To make matters very simple, your thyroid gland needs iodine to convert T4 into a usable form of T3. Okay, if you have T4, which is the precursor to thyroid, that's great, but you can't really use that until it's converted into T3. So what your body does is it combines iodine with tyrosine. And when it does that, it creates T1, T2, T3, T4, but it also helps the conversion process of T4 to T3. Now, this is very important to boost your metabolism, but there's a secondary thing I want to talk about, and that's getting chromium in. Okay, chromium is a mineral that you can get, honestly, very inexpensively on Amazon. What chromium is going to do is it's going to help GLUT4 receptors come to the surface. What does that mean? It means that blood sugar that's floating through your body sometimes doesn't have a place to go. But if you take a little bit of chromium, it makes it so that the receptors that are inside our cells come to the surface of the cell to collect the extra glucose. Now, this can help you in a lot of ways, but it helps your thyroid because there's a lot of links with high blood sugar and insulin levels slowing down our thyroid. So let's control that and actually solve the issue, not just treat the symptom, okay? So iodine is going to help you create more thyroid, but let's solve the problem too with the chromium. Now, you're going to get your iodine through kelp or through seaweed or something like that. Don't get it through iodized salt. That stuff is bleached and completely stripped of the minerals. It's not the best way to get your iodine. Okay, next one is going to be consuming my ACV drink. Now, my ACV drink isn't a product, okay? It's just a collection of different ingredients. So it's usually 10 to 12 ounces of water combined with a couple tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, about a half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, and a little bit of lemon. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now, the reason that I compiled this is simply because it does have some metabolic repair effects. Okay, number one, the cayenne is going to have a thermic effect. It does boost your core body temperature just a tiny bit so your metabolism can improve a little bit right there. Okay, but it has some other effects too. It also improves dopamine levels. So when your dopamine levels are up a little bit, your dopamine hits are being satisfied, you have less cravings, which means you're eating less bad things that are affecting your metabolism negatively. Okay, next up, apple cider vinegar. The acetic acid within the apple cider vinegar upregulates fatty acid oxidation. So it helps improve the body's utilization of fats. This is a phenomenal thing for fat loss, but then from a metabolism standpoint, it actually helps with uncoupling proteins one and two. So what that means is it actually allows the fat to be utilized to create body heat better, which means your metabolism is going to enhance because you have more body heat, especially alongside the cayenne. And then the lemon comes in from a fiber standpoint. You get a little bit of pectin, it's gonna help you out with satiety. Now, optional, you can add some salt into the mix. I usually just put a pinch of salt. Okay, the salt is going to help you out with craving sometimes. We have NST receptors. All that means is sometimes our body craves sweets when it's really craving salt. So I find that by nipping this in the bud in the morning, it can make a big difference. The number three way to go ahead and fix your metabolism up a little bit is don't be afraid to overeat, but overeat with protein, okay? Protein already has a powerful thermic effect, okay? 20 to 25% of the protein that we consume is going to end up just being utilized just to metabolize that protein. So 25% of the energy from what we eat in protein just goes into digesting that specific amount of protein anyway, okay? So it takes a lot of energy, which is a great thing. 
But when we look at overall metabolism, there's an interesting study that was published in the journal JAMA. Okay, this study took a look at individuals that were put into a hypercaloric state, meaning they had them eat 140% of their daily caloric needs. So they ate a lot more to the point where they would gain weight, right? Well, they divided them into three hypercaloric groups. One group consumed low protein, one group consumed moderate protein, and one group consumed high amounts of protein, but all consuming the same ultimate amount of calories, which was a lot, about a thousand extra calories. So needless to say, they all gained weight. But what's wild is they all gained about the same amount of fat. The protein group gained a little bit less, but ultimately about the same amount of fat. The protein group, however, gained muscle too. They gained a good amount of muscle. So they actually technically gained more weight than the other groups, but the extra weight gained was muscle. So the point in saying this is extra protein doesn't convert to extra fat. Extra protein converts to extra muscle. So if you're going to overeat, you might as well overeat with protein because at least it's going to build more muscle, which is the biggest driver of your metabolism. More muscle builds your metabolism faster. So this is a great way to have your, well, steak and eat it too, I guess. All right, now let's go ahead and move into number four which is get the proper leptin spike with the proper kind of cheat meal. Okay, so leptin is a simple thing. Leptin communicates from the fat cell to the brain and says, hey brain, we have enough fat on hand, go ahead and ramp up the metabolism. Pretty simple. If leptin levels are low, we don't have a lot of leptin, so the brain doesn't get the signal to turn up the metabolism, so the metabolism slows down. A lot of times it is a leptin issue. More than often than not, it's a thyroid issue, but sometimes it's a leptin issue because we've been dieting for a long period of time. If you've been dieting for a long period of time, you need a leptin spike, but you have to spike your leptin with carbohydrates to really get a powerful leptin spike. You can spike it with fat, but honestly, it just works better with carbs. The American Journal of Physiology published a study that found this. They took two groups. One had a, a cheat meal with carbohydrates. One had a cheat meal with fat. The carb group had significantly higher spikes in leptin. One very important thing to note, though, is if you have a cheat meal with carbs, Keep the fats out of the equation. Do not mix fats and carbs because then that cheat meal will go to storage a lot more. It simply has to do with spiking the insulin and allowing fat to come in. Okay, we just wanna have a high carbohydrate meal. Try to keep it with no sugar. Just keep it good, healthy, good, clean starches like maybe lentil pasta or chickpea pasta, something like that. And that will spike your leptin levels. So do that a couple times over a two week period. Try to spike your leptin a little bit and then incorporate all these other things too. Number five is gonna be slow down on the high intensity workouts for a little bit, okay? I'm all for high intensity interval training. Trust me, I talk about it all the time and the benefits of it. But how many times have you seen someone that is overweight and their body hasn't changed, or maybe it's you, your body hasn't changed in a long time, and they're still just grinding away at their CrossFit workouts, but their body never changes. It's a perfect example of adrenal overload. Like you're pushing your body so hard all the time that your adrenals are getting burned out and your cortisol levels are staying so high that you're ultimately ending up with a body fat accumulation issue. So what you need to do is you need to back off the high intensity work for a little bit. Trust me, it has its place and it'll come back, but you need to let your system come back down and chill out. So take a break and switch over to strength training for a little bit and limit the cardio. And if you do cardio, just kind of tone it down to just easy cardio for a little bit. Don't worry, it's not long term. Okay, strength training is gonna build the muscle, that's gonna boost the metabolism. Allow yourself the chance to build some muscle Okay, because a lot of times when you're strength training combined with high intensity interval training in one setting, like in CrossFit, for example, you end up putting yourself in a situation where your body's getting conditioned, but from a body composition standpoint, it's so taxed, you're not able to actually get the effect from the strength training. And it's nothing against CrossFit. It's just when you're taxed, you're taxed. Number six is going to be reduce your caffeine by half. I'm not the kind of guy that's going to tell you to cut out caffeine altogether. Okay, not at all. I like my caffeine. I like my coffee. I like my tea. But cut your caffeine in half. What ends up happening is we have this thing called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and it communicates from the brain to the adrenals to produce more cortisol, to produce more epinephrine. Coffee in and of itself, caffeine in and of itself, produces more epinephrine and more adrenaline. Okay, it's kind of what it does. So we just need to lessen the impact of that a little bit. If you go cold turkey off of caffeine, it just makes it so that when you do have caffeine, you're going to have a bigger cortisol spike. So it's okay to keep it in the system because your body's gonna actually be able to modulate a little bit and just have less cortisol being secreted. But that way you still get your energy boost and after like two or three days of cutting your caffeine in half, you'll be fine. So what I do is I switch to half calf. I do half caffeine, half decaf, tastes just the same. I still feel like I get the same effect. Number seven is going to be adding a good quality salt. Yeah, 
right, I know. Most people, when they go on a diet or they make changes, they try to reduce sodium. And what ends up happening is people's metabolism slows down. Okay, so then they start grasping for straws. They're like, well, what can I do to lose a little bit more weight? So they start saying like, well, I'm gonna cut out sodium. And then they drop some water weight, so they feel really good. So they continue to drop sodium, and they realize, ah, oh, sodium was the issue. But that only goes so far, and in fact, it backfires on you. What happens when you're deficient in sodium is your brain gets a little bit of a mixed message. Your brain says, hey, put on the brakes, we're low in sodium. So the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis ends up kind of getting whacked out, and it makes it so the adrenals trigger the release of what's called aldosterone. That aldosterone tells the kidneys to hold on to water and salt, and what ends up happening then is you end up having a subsequent increase in cortisol. When aldosterone is released, cortisol is also released. So then you have too much cortisol at a time when you don't need it. Cortisol is not bad, but it's bad when it's at the wrong time. So then you have chronically high levels of cortisol, which definitely trigger an accumulation of predominantly belly fat, okay, mainly visceral and abdominal fat. So we have a big problem there. We're, if, we're, if we're not fixing this issue, we're just gonna have this constant load on the adrenals and this constant accumulation and it's going to end up slowing down our metabolism so don't be afraid to add some salt that's why i add that salt to that morning drink number eight is try a 36 hour fast now i put this in here because so many of the people that watch my videos that are subscribed to me if you're a new viewer then just forgive me are already people that intermittent fast so one of the ways that i suggest just kickstarting the body into a new method is doing a 36 hour fast okay and this works for anybody go from evening all the way to the next evening and then the next morning, okay? So from like 7 p.m. all the way to 7 a.m., not the next day, but the day after, okay? So you have one full day of not eating at all. Now what this does is A, allows you to kickstart a lot of a metabolic process, but it also makes it so that you can take advantage of some cool things. There's a study that was published in BMC Genomics that found that in the mornings, and especially after a fast, we have very insulin-sensitive muscles, but insulin-resistant fat cells. So it means that we can actually spike our leptin and we can eat a larger meal at the end of that 36 hour fast and it's not going to go to fat storage nearly as much as if we ended that fast in the evening. See, we have diurnal rhythms that change. We actually are less apt to store fat in the morning than we are in the evening. So if we do a 36 hour fast and we fast all the way through to the morning, we can break that fast and have a lot more leeway and a lot more flexibility to not gain fat. It's actually pretty cool. Plus, the benefits of a 36-hour fast are awesome anyway. So that's a great way to just kind of kickstart that metabolism again. The next way to fix or repair a slowed metabolism is to work on the conversion of white fat to brown fat. Okay, so this is something that's going to just get your metabolism stoked a little bit more. We have white fat and we have brown fat. So white fat is just the fat that just kind of hangs out on our body. It's just insulating. It doesn't really do anything other than be unsightly and keep us warm. Brown fat, on the other hand, is what triggers thermogenesis. It actually creates the, it has activity. So it's what triggers kind of that shivering. It's non-shivering thermogenesis is what it's called. So basically it makes it so it generates heat. Now that takes calories. So brown fat actually takes energy and allows us to burn more fat. So if we can take the same fat and the same fat mass and make some of that fat mass brown fat versus white fat, then we can have some really powerful effects on our metabolism. So there's a study that was published in biochemical and biophysical research that found that curcumin, like from turmeric, has the ability to switch this over, to switch white fat to brown fat. So if we add turmeric to our meals, add turmeric to our drinks, whatever, we have a powerful effect on doing that. And it does this in a non-catecholamine way, so a non-epinephrine related way. Normally, it takes high intensity activity to get this conversion to happen, but turmeric allows it to happen through a different pathway. And this conversion is really, really powerful. Another thing that you can do is do some cold water therapy now and then. Cold water therapy forces you to develop more brown fat tissue. It doesn't make you gain fat, it makes you convert white fat into brown fat because it's trying to adapt to being exposed to some cold water now and then. This means that you're left with, again, the same amount of fat. You're not trying to burn fat. You're just having a different kind of fat that ultimately burns your metabolism a little bit hotter later on. So it fixes a slow metabolism. Next up is going to be a maintenance thing. Number 10, utilize a low carb, high fat diet to keep the weight off. Okay, if you rebound and bounce, it's like a bouncy ball. Think about it like this. Every time you rebound in weight, the bounce gets smaller. If I were to throw a bouncy ball right now, it would bounce nice and high. Then the second bounce, it would bounce lower and lower and lower and lower until it's flat, right? Well, the same thing kind of happens with your metabolism because what happens is every time you diet and lose some weight, your metabolism is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So you may kickstart your metabolism with some of these things and lose a little bit more weight, but if you're not careful, you're gonna fall into the same trap. So the nice thing is with a low carb, high fat diet, there's studies that ultimately prove 
your metabolism stays hotter than through other diets. So the journal Nutrition and Metabolism published a study, took a look at a bunch of individuals that lost weight over a four-month period of time. So it had them lose weight over four months, 45 pounds to be exact. So 45 pounds over four months is a lot of weight to lose. And what it found is that those that lost weight on a ketogenic or low-carb diet ended up maintaining the same lean body mass and the same resting metabolic rate. So what that means is they were able to lose 45 pounds and their metabolism never slowed down as a result. Usually when you lose weight, you lose some metabolism too. Not with a low carb, high fat diet. So use that to keep the weight off. Utilize these tricks to stoke your metabolism, utilize some fasting, but once the weight is off, do a low carb, high fat just as your maintenance. Even if it's not full keto, it's gonna help you maintain the muscle mass that ultimately drives your metabolism. So as always, make sure you're keeping it locked in here on my channel. If you have ideas for future videos like this, talking about metabolism, fat burning, brown fat, white fat, you name it, put them down below. See you soon.